Hello, Forrest, my friend. Great to see you, Hello. and thank you for participating in this event series. It's great to great to see you. This is this is wonderful. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Absolutely. So I'm very excited to have uh, Professor Forrest Stewart here with us today, uh, even if it is on Zoom rather than in person, because Forrest is in Europe. Uh, Forrest is a professor of sociology and the director of the Stanford Ethnography Lab. He is also uh, going to start as director of our Urban Studies program when he is back from sabbatical in Europe. Uh, Forrest is an urban ethnographer using uh, field work and other qualitative methods to investigate contemporary urban poverty. He has published two books on the topic. His first, Down, Out, and Under Arrest, Policing and Everyday Life in Skid Row, is an in-depth ethnography of Los Angeles Skid Row District, a, a neighborhood that is uh, one of the most impoverished and most heavily policed in America. Uh, his second book, Ballad of the Bullet, Gangs, Drill Music, and the Power of Online Infamy, is about how gang-affiliated youth use social media uh, to commodify representations of poverty and violence in Chicago's South Side. Uh, Forrest is a 2020 MacArthur Fellow for his work that challenges the long-held assumptions about the forces that shape urban poverty and violence. Uh, and, you know, Forrest's specialty really is bringing to light the lived reality of those who experience it. Uh, he spent years listening to homeless people in Skid Row in LA and to young gang-associated men in the south side of Chicago. He's a member of the Sociological Research Association, uh, and his book received numerous awards from the American Sociological Association, the American Society of Criminology, uh, and the University of Chicago Press. So welcome, Forrest. Wow, thank you. that's uh, quite an introduction. I, uh, I really appreciate it. So, you know, one thing I learned from your books is how what might seem as irrational behavior from the outside is actually really rational uh, when you put yourself in the shoes of residences of this criminalized neighborhood. So, uh, and you can only really discover this when you make sincere efforts to see the world from their perspective. So, Maybe can you talk a bit about the importance of listening and of empathy in your research, you know, and how important has it been that you actually got to spend time in these neighborhoods and to get to know uh, well the residences there? Yeah, I love this. I think you just made a pitch for for doing the kind of research that I do and the kind of research that I love. So I thank you for that. This <laughs> is fantastic. Um, I don't know, I think maybe folks maybe some of the folks watching this might not be super familiar with this term ethnography. I mean, just kind of in a basic sense, we can think of ethnography. We used to call it like naturalistic research, which is like the researcher leaves the ivory tower, goes and hangs out with the people that they're interested in, right? Like you're interested in garbage men and how they do their thing. You go hang out with garbage men. You're interested in drug dealers. You go hang out with drug dealers. Um, we can think of it as kind of like the, the polar opposite from like experimental research, right? Experimental research, you bring somebody in, you poke and prod, you do some manipulation and you see what they choose. They choose to eat the marshmallow or not, right? And so this is saying, no, maybe they wouldn't have eaten that marshmallow if we'd seen them kind of in their own home. And so it's our job to leave the experimental lab and like go and sit with them in their home for years and years and years. And then we learn that like, oh, there's there's more to this marshmallow thing right, than we than we used to think. Um, I'm in Germany right now. So, so uh, it's, it's appropriate. Uh, there's this uh, German sociologist, Max Weber, who you know, is really famous for this term Verstehen, which is exactly this empathy, kind of putting yourself in other people's shoes. And, and I think that, like, of course, you know, through writing ethnography, like, we enable readers to kind of live some experiences and live some worlds, some social worlds and some cultures that, like, maybe they couldn't live before. But I think it's actually, like, more serious than that. To, to, to do a social science that focuses on empathy, I actually think is super powerful. Um, I think it's powerful because, you know, what we're trying to do with social scientists is, like, explain why the world looks the way that it does. Right. We're trying to explain causality. Why did uh, why happen? Right. Like we're trying to find the X that connects. Why did why did why happen? And, and and I think that I'm biased. I'm an ethnographer, but I think that like ethnography is really good at this because, you know, when you brought up rational irrationality. I think it kind of speaks back to what has become a dominant way of explaining the world that we all kind of walk around with. 
that I think is really informed, no offense to any economists, right? Like it's really inf informed by economist ways of thinking, kind of like thinking about people. I mean, economists have gotten much better at this, but I think at, at one point in time, economists were walking around the world thinking that people, you know, kind of weigh cost and benefit in this quite rational way. Um, oftentimes it's economic or financial. Like if I do this thing, will I get more money? If I do this thing, will I get less money? And I think what ethnographers and a lot of sociologists are trying to do, what I'm really trying to do um, is to say, wait, hold on a second. There's a whole set of messy, emotional, symbolic factors that if we actually go and sit with people and understand the challenges they're dealing with in their own lives, suddenly like the fact that they chose this thing that you wouldn't have chosen becomes absolutely rational. Uh, if I can give a shout out to, to one of our um, one of our PhD graduates, uh, Priya Fielding Singh, um, did this really wonderful book called How the Other Half Eats. And I think it's such a beautiful example of like what we get when we do a social science with empathy. And what she did is she studied low-income mothers' food choices and like mm -hmm. grocery choices and eating choices. And, you know, this is a topic that like, public health folks, people in universities like Stanford kind of wring their hands about like, why is it that like low income folks are like, they're eating junk food a ton. And like there, there we see higher levels of obesity. Like, what should we do? What should we do? And, you know, some, some good policymaker will say, oh, it's a, it's a problem of education. Like we need to tell them that like fruits and vegetables are the way to go. And, you know, for other people, they'll be like, oh, it's a, it's a con constrained choice set or like, um, you know, maybe they'll even cast it off to like, uh, their taste buds are different or like, get, you know, we get some wild explanations as to why we see, uh, low income folks eating more, say fast food or more, um, uh, you know, junk food. And what Priya Fielding Singh did was like hung out with low income mothers. And so she's got this great example um, of this mom with her daughter and they would go every week to get like frappuccinos from Starbucks, like huge, massive frappuccinos with whipped cream. And the, this is the exact kind of consumption, food consumption behavior that like public health folks are like, no, no, no. Like we've got a diabetes issue and that's sugary. And why are you dumping 2000 calories in a single drink into your daughter? Right. And what, what Fielding Singh found out was that like these mothers kind of, they know all that stuff. Like they don't need more education campaigns. Like they know what's going on, but given their limited resources, like that Frappuccino was like this kind of act of love. And like this moment that they could like, sh she could share with her daughter, maybe every Wednesday after school. And sure, it gave them both a sugar rush, but it was like an activity they did with each other in a world where activities to show your daughter that you love her and want to give her the world's finest things and want to bond with her are, are, are limited right? Like we, we have very limited opportunities for these kinds of things. So suddenly that mother buying the Frappuccino every Wednesday for her daughter, potentially, you know, jeopardizing her daughter's future health, suddenly like our policy interventions into that are very different than like roping her into like, you know, feed your kid fruits and vegetables every day. It's more like, oh, wait, maybe we need to change some things in your neighborhood and in the income distribution such that like there are other things besides a Frappuccino, right? Um, that maybe you couldn't attain previously monetarily, financially, um, that will allow you to, to, to feel the kind of emotions that you would feel over this cap uh, over this frappuccino. So yeah, so I just think, you know, I think empathy as a as a as a route to social science is something that I'm committed to and something that that I think ethnographers are really trying to trying to 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 bring out. It's amazing as uh, uh, Forrest. Uh, we should have a separate conversation. I think economists did get better and uh, yes. you know, I, 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 should, <laughs> I agree. I, should tell, I agree. I should, I should tell you that I'm I'm an economic historian and uh, you know for us, you know, also like uh, you know, really understanding the context that you study and not from the perspective of some what's a general global behavior that you might expect but from the perspective of people who lived through it is important but you know like i this is this is really uh this is really fascinating uh you, you know you spent you spent five years in the in the streets of of skid row in los angeles uh, a neighborhood known for for its poverty and and high crime and high rates of homelessness and you were studying there how racial social and economic uh, inequality is affecting the everyday lives of people who live in this neighborhood. Now, 
Maybe we can start by you telling me about your experience working there. So I know I know that uh, you yourself was stopped on the street by police, like, I don't know, more than 10 times while doing your research. So <laughs> I would love to hear more about that. Yeah, yeah. And this is, I mean, you know, I so I, so I have this book about policing in Skid Row. Um, and it's really interesting. The, the, the book in this project uh, didn't actually start as a, as a project on policing. It was, it was a project initially on um, thinking about the kind of bootstraps narrative that we have in the United States and thinking about how is it that someone from the very lowest rung on the kind of social economic ladder in America could possibly climb up the rungs and thing meet the middle class. Uh, and I had, you know, I had, been, I had been doing a lot of um, activism in, in undergraduate and grad school around um, kind of prison reform, you know, providing services for people reentering society from prisons, from jails. And I was in Los Angeles and learned that like, there's this place, Skid Row. I, I had not been there yet where Yes, there's something like more parolees and probationers in like these 50 blocks than anywhere else in the city of Los Angeles. It is like the epicenter for like where you go after you're released from prison or from jail. Like the Twin Towers jail in Los Angeles is just up the street. This is the largest jail complex in the world. There's an, a Greyhound station right nearby and, you know, up and down the California coast, right? When you're, you're released from prison, you're often given some gate money and you buy yourself a Greyhound ticket and this is one of the places you go. It's got like lots of services, lots of cheap food and lots of shelters. And so my idea was like, okay, um, can we walk alongside some people as they are trying to climb out of the gutter to see like, what does it take? And what are the biggest obstacles for someone getting back on their feet? Like this is somebody who's like either fresh out of prison or this is somebody who's, uh, you know, uh, fresh out of a domestic violence situation and they've, they've hit the streets, they've hit Skid Row. This is somebody who maybe is trying to climb out of addiction. You name it, like people at the bottom rungs. And so I started following people around. Um, and, and, you know, I, I, I learned a lot, but one of the things that kind of struck me both literally and figuratively <laughs> was the police, was the police. And like, I would see all these instances where, you know, somebody had, they were like staying in a shelter and, you know, they were on their way to maybe get some transitional housing or, you know, they'd, you, they'd be making some slow, steady progress, kind of just grinding their way through and then they would run into the buzzsaw of policing in jail. And, and Los Angeles, like a lot of other cities, has a lot of these laws that a lot of us don't know about that can get people trapped up and just like knock people back onto their butts. Um, and one of them in Los Angeles, it's illegal to sit, lie, or sleep on the sidewalk. LA Municipal Code 4118D, which I had no idea about until I went into to, to Skid Row. Um, it's a misdemeanor. It's actually an arrestable offense. So officers will arrest you, put you in the back of a squad car, take you to booking. Um, and, and depending on like, if you have a record or, or what you've done, maybe you've resisted arrest, Lord knows, like that can be life-threatening. You, you could spend, you could spend some days in jail, right? Even if you're released, even if you're, you know, even if the charges are, are eventually dropped. And so I was seeing you know, like people lose their, right? So like, imagine this, um, you have to line up for a shelter bed at 5 p.m. You sleep there and then they kick you out at 5 a.m. If you're busted, right, you're, and you're released, even if you're not charged and you're released at 8 p.m., guess what? You lost your, you lost your bed. Um, or let's imagine like you're walking on the way to the shelter. It's 4.45. You're going to make it. You're going to hit the line. And um, you get caught up in one of these big jaywalking busts. And, and once that hand in Los Angeles starts flashing, officers standing on the opposite side of the street use this as an opportunity to, to, to pull people aside. They pull tons of people aside, do stop and frisk, looking for drugs, looking for wants and warrants, right? Running you through a warrant database. You're sometimes there for like a half an hour lined up with a bunch of other people. Guess what? When you're done, it's now 515 and you've lost, you've lost the bed for the night. And now you're forced to sleep on the streets. All kinds of things happen if you're rough sleeping, right? There's there's arson, there's robbery, there's there's all kinds of things. It's 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 not a good scene to sit up, sleep on the streets. Or say you have a job interview the next day, um, but you're busting. You have to spend the night in jail for a charge that's eventually kicked out. So it was just like everybody was just getting caught up in this. And I was seeing, for me, I had not necessarily heard any accounts previously about how the police 
were the ones um, or the, the, the kind of institution that kept knocking people down, right? We often think about there not being enough rungs on the ladder for people to climb, right? And that's a lot of our policy interventions are about, let's make more rungs, let's make more rungs, or let's make the rungs closer together so that people can reach them. We don't often think about the fact that there's this, like this other thing that comes swinging down on this wrecking ball that just like either knocks the rung out from underneath you or knocks you off that you have to start again um, at the bottom. And so, you know, so this was this, this kind of like initial inspiration and, and kind of on my way there, you know, I, I develop, I, I end up developing all these beautiful relationships with a lot of people, with with homeless folks, with drug dealers, with, uh, you know, substance users, with activists. I even like spent a lot of time hanging out with police officers. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it, it was, it was a kind of a field work wise. It was, I don't know, it was interesting. It was a little bit difficult. It, it turns out that uh, it's hard being an ethnographer in a neighborhood where there are a lot of police, especially a lot of undercover cops walking around because like, turns out ethnographers are doing the same exact things that a narcotics undercover officer are doing, right? I'm like watching people, I'm listening closely, I'm striking up conversations with strangers, I'm writing little things in a book, and maybe I've got like a tape recorder. Um, and so I had to really negotiate and navigate this space, which was another thing that that just kind of made it resonate how much policing had kind of saturated this, the, even the mindsets of people in this neighborhood, which, which, which really convinced me um, that we need to start thinking really seriously about not just poverty, but the policing of poverty. And, and, you know, the, and, you know, you say that uh, uh, when you let people speak in their own, you know, like you let, you give them the time and space to speak rather, you know, like rather than superimpose your way of thinking about them. Suddenly this is when you start to hear, uh, you know, the real story and they are happy to share. And, and you say that, uh, I think you said at some point that, you know, like many people on both sides, both the police and, and the folks uh, on, on the street, you know, like they, they are genuinely trying to do the right thing, but somehow often they, they come short. So, so uh, yeah. it's, and so, and you ended up like uh, uh, publishing, you know, your, your research findings in this, you know, like fabulous book that I really recommend everyone uh, Thank you. read, you know, like down, out and under arrest. Uh, do you want to tell us a couple of the, the main takeaways that, uh, that you find in the sure. book? Sure. Sure. Yeah. And I'll, I'll pick up on, I'll, I'll pick up on, you know, something you just kind of dropped out there around people on both sides trying to do their best. And I do mean both the police and the police. Um, I, I often didn't see a, a lot of research that encompassed the voices of both sets of sets of people and thinking about how those interactions were and what those interactions meant for both of them. And, you know, it's interesting, like this is actually, um, studying the police and giving the police voice is, is actually something that my radical lefty friends really push back on me for. And um, I, I have gotten some criticism, which I am happy to take because I feel as though my job is social science. Like my job is to ask questions of like, why do we have the kinds of police interactions that we have? And, and, and you know, we can't, answer that question unless we actually kind of plant our butts next to police officers or in my case like walk next to police officers and so what i'm trying to do in the book is to um, i guess you could say like i'm trying to offer like two correctives so there were like kind of two narratives two conversations that were going on that i found kind of inadequate on the policing side you know first i, I saw a dearth of kind of contemporary efforts to kind of understand how the police were thinking about what they're doing and thinking about how that might be something we could with policy interventions kind of poke and prod. And, um, you know, one of the kind of narratives that we often see in studies of policing, especially since maybe the mid nineties was like this image of, I mean, not to be crude about it, kind of hyper racist officers who wake up in the, in the morning and say, I'm going to go out today and make the world terrible for black and brown folks. And then there they are kind of goose stepping stormtrooper style down the streets of, of poor urban neighborhoods. And I, and I think that narrative and that image is a, is a, 
is an influential political one. I think it's a um, persuasive one. I think if you're trying to win a rhetorical argument or stump speech, I think that maybe it's effective there. I just don't think it's good social science. Um, and so one of the things that I discovered uh, hanging out with police officers was that many of these guys who were being the most violent, who were being the most repressive, who were making life the most miserable for poor people were actually some of the most compassionate guys on the police force. You know, one of the guys, um, you know, you've read the book, so you've seen there's this scene that I sketched. I'm like in a bar hanging out with one of these officers. This I call him Manny in the book. They're all pseudonyms. But this guy, Manny, I followed him out in, in, in Skid Row quite a bit. And we're, you know, we're bonding over, over the Dodgers and we're having a beer kind of in Echo Park just a little bit outside of... Um, outside of Skid Row and, 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 and I learned, I learned before that Manny's a vet. He's a, he's a, he's a, he's a veteran, right? He was, he was in Iraq um, and he sees veterans out in Skid Row and he sees them kind of drinking themselves to death and he wants to do something, but like, and, and you know, he, he has this, this, we have this kind of beautiful moment where he's like, look, like I'm not a social worker. I don't work for like the social services agency. Like they're messing up. Like they have let my brothers in arms fall through the cracks. And like, I don't know what to do. Like, I don't have beds. I'm not a shelter. I'm not, you know, an employment agency. The only thing I have essentially is like the tools of violence, right? I have a gun, I have a baton, I have a taser, I have handcuffs, I have access to a jail. And so uh, many of these very compassionate officers have found this way to try to help people in the only way they are equipped to do so, which is to like take them off the streets forcefully, put them in jail in the hopes, right? They know that jail does horrible things to people, but they're hoping just maybe, just maybe, you know, this guy will sober up. And, it, and, it's, not, and it's not because they genuinely deep in their heart of hearts think that jail is a good thing for him, but they're like, like what are the tools I have? I can shoot him, I can tase him, or I can put him in jail. Like that's, that's all I've got as an officer. And so like what this, what this discovery really pushed me to think about was that like, wow, when we're trying to push levers to reform policing, we are overly obsessed with like changing the hearts and minds of officers, right? Like let's train them more. Let's teach them about schizophrenia. Let's teach them about drug addiction. Like let's teach them about tolerance. And it's like, this guy, Manny, he knew all those things. Like he loved the guys that he was being, you know, repressive toward. Um, and, so I, and so I think what it conveys to us is that so long as the only tool that we as a society, or, or as long as the primary tool that we as a society are using to catch the people who fall through the social safety net, if the only tool we're using is policing, we're always going to have the kind of repression and violence and, and negative consequences, you know, that we see. And it really makes us think, oh, maybe, maybe it's the social safety net. Maybe we need to like reweave that thing so that people don't fall. Or maybe we need to say, hey, maybe police officers aren't the ones who should be catching these people. Like maybe they should be, it should be social workers. Maybe it should be outreach workers. Maybe it should be case managers. Like maybe, maybe there's an institution we can think of that's just like better at this thing and, and doesn't have, have handguns. Um, that was long-winded, but that was the first corrective. Well, very quickly, the kind of second corrective. Um, you know, I, I was doing a study right at a time when we started using this term collateral consequences. And this was this was the, this is this kind of term that we use to measure the kind of spillover effects that happen when somebody is cycling through the criminal justice system. Um, so we know lots of things. We know that like, you know, one in three black men in their lifetime will, will go to prison. And we know that once you come out, like your your employability like plummets. We know that your health you know, plummets. We know just all these outcomes are, are really terrible. We, we're increasingly learning that like, even just like having lots of run-ins with police um, leads you to engage less with institutions, leads you to engage less with healthcare, leads you to engage less with like financial institutions, educational institutions, you name it, um, increases in PTSD. So we knew like statistically kind of public health wise what was going on. Um, but I was, I, again, like I was interested in kind of causality and mechanisms. And I, and I wanted to know like, what, what's the black box connecting policing and all these different outcomes. And one of the things that I came to realize was that um, policing was like infiltrating like the very minds and kind of public culture 
of neighborhoods. And I think that like that's this kind of cultural collateral consequence or like cultural spillover effect that kind of leaves its stain in a neighborhood that we don't often talk about. So one of the things like, that I that I kind of bring up in this book is this thing called cop wisdom. And it's this notion that like, if you're so obsessed with avoiding the cops and not having the cops stop you, you've, got, you've done nothing. You've got no paraphernalia on you. You're just trying to get to the bus stop. If you want stops, cop stop stopping you um you have to start thinking like a cop and seeing like a cop and when you do that suddenly all kinds of the things we love about neighborhoods people may be living in in non-policed neighborhoods um all the things that make a neighborhood great all the things that make a neighborhood thrive standing outside talking to neighbors nope can't do that because the police think that's a drug deal right um walking the wrong way down a one-way street grooming yourself or twitching too much or like smoothing out your hair too much or picking lint off of you oh those are all signs of like mental health issues or drug addiction um buying in in in, in skin row like buying loose cigarettes you know what does that look like that looks like a hand-to-hand -hand transaction of a little bit of drugs right so like all these things that like poverty researchers show are vital for people exchanging resources and developing social ties, standing at the bus stop, talking to somebody, a stranger. Oh, you, you need an apartment? I need a, a car. Like, let's do some kind of trade. Can't do those, right? Because you're so afraid of the police coming through. And, and, and so that's kind of like the second thing that I kind of want to put on the table, right? That like, let's rethink how we think about the effects of policing. We often think about policing as like removing things from a community. It removes resources, it removes men, it removes fathers and sons, but it also leaves something there in the form of like new ways of even interacting with our world that I'm, I'm glad now is we're, we're starting to talk about a whole lot more. Yeah, this is a fascinating. So, so you know, like one way to think about it, it's, so it's not bad people, but so it, it's bad policies. And so, you know, one of your conclusions is that uh, we tend to have stereotypes about poverty and violence yeah. as ones that are rooted in bad choices, but poverty and violence are often the results of policies that advantage mm -hmm. some and disadvantage others. So, so maybe you can explain what you mean by this. And like, if you have like, uh, do you make like concrete policy recommendations uh, in that, uh, you know, like uh, in, in, do you have in mind or it's more like a description of how the situation is right now? I think I think both. I think both. Increasingly, I, I think I'm getting better at not just diagnosing problems. I feel like I've spent so much of my career diagnosing the problems, and and I think now I'm getting to a stage of my career where I think it's my responsibility to start trying to prescribe some solutions based on those those diagnoses. So this question of poverty, um, thinking about poverty as as or you know, let me back up. So. Um, in sociology right now, I'm, and I'm, I'm really thankful for, for folks like Matt Desmond um, at Princeton. He's, you know, he's, he's a darling right now. He wrote Evicted, and now he wrote this new Poverty by America book. You know, he, he was one of the first folks to re-articulate what I think was articulated by lots of kind of critical leftists, and Marx was articulating this. But, but Matt Desmond's kind of brought this back into the kind of public consciousness that, like, let's stop thinking about poverty as a lack Right. As a as I am somebody who is impoverished and that is defined as we can understand that or conceptualize that as I lack some things. And one of the things that Matt and some others have said is like, no, let's think about poverty as a relationship. Let's think about we can only have someone in poverty or we can only have somebody exploited or we can only have somebody disadvantaged if there's somebody else who's getting over right that like somebody out there in the world is benefiting from this person's kind of fall down to the bottom of the socioeconomic structure. Um, and, and I think it's, it's, I think it's really helpful in a lot of ways. I think it's helpful in terms of um, reminding us how we think about, about budgeting, how we think about policy. Uh, you know, there's, there's these great quotes about how, you know, show me your budget and I'll show you what your values are. Right. I, I, I think we can attune it to poverty too, which is like, show me your budget and I'll show you who you are working for and working against. Right. Like somebody in that, there are two people in that budget line or two groups of people in every budget line. There's the people whose lives are going to get worse or at least not better. And there's some people whose lives are going to get much better. Um, you know, I, I, let me, I'm trying to think of a, a, a more concrete example because that's, I think, a little bit abstract. Um, you know, I, we're talking about Skid Row, so we can think about policing. Policing is a good way to kind of think through poverty as a relation. Um, so, so obviously, paper policing, as I just described, 
really exacerbates and can reproduce poverty. And so we might ask, okay, why do we have, why did we start to have hyper-policing say in the eighties, nineties and, and, and now? Well, one of the answers is that cities decided to pursue a different kind of economic policy to revitalize their downtowns, right? New York was one of the first to do this. They turned into what's often called like an entrepreneurial city. And the idea is, look, our downtowns are looking bombed out. Like there's no capital generation there. There's no capital accumulation here. Like we got to do something like Times Square looks pretty bad. It's really seedy. There's strip joints. It's like not a place where we want to go. Similar things happen, you know, a couple decades later um, in Los Angeles. And so these entrepreneurial cities, what they did is they said, wait, there's, there's capital out there in the world. We need to attract it. We need to bring it to our city and we need to set up shop right in our downtown streets that were, you know, escaped during kind of the suburbanization. But one of the things that you have to do to lure capital, mobile capital to your city, you got to clean up the streets, right? Um, uh, the Apple store doesn't want to come in next to some place where there's, I don't know, um, low income folks living in affordable housing, you know, housing project, right? Or, um, you know, homeless people on the street. So what we see, um, you know, thanks to folks like Giuliani, folks like Bill Bratton, the police chief who, who kind of instituted broken windows, kind of zero tolerance policing in, in uh, New York at the time and later in Los Angeles when I was sitting there. So they said, all right, let's do stop and frisk. Let's arrest as many people as we can. Let's make life as uncomfortable for people as we can. Let's make sure homeless people never get a chance to sit down and rest. Let's make sure they never get a chance to sit down and eat because we're going to try and clear them out as much as we possibly can. Um, I've got, a, I've got a, a, a paper that came out recently uh, with a colleague of mine, Charlie Collins at the University of Washington, where we, we run the numbers on this uh, in Los Angeles, you know, for, for a couple decades. And we find that like where you find gentrification in neighborhoods, uh, in, increases in, in, in more wealthy people, decreases in poor people, kind of displacement, you see far more policing. And there's, you know, increasingly more studies being published that show that like where there's reinvestment in capital, you see policing. And so I think that's a, a, a really prime example that, you know, the, the kinds of collateral consequences I was talking about, you know, they, they don't just come out of nowhere. Like they're, they're often being done, you know, in the name of someone else, in the name of someone else um, getting an advantage. And so I think it's really helpful to always kind of remember there's a second side of the coin, right? Somebody is, somebody is doing well if somebody is, 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 is not doing so well. Right. And, you know, you, you also studied uh, gangs in the south side of Chicago. And your second book, which is equal, equally fabulous, uh, Ballad of the Bullet. This one I actually uh, recommended my kids to to, to <laughs> as well. Uh, I love that. Tell, tells the story of of how young black men who face diminishing opportunities in in these neighborhoods uh, turn into social media with the hope of of making it. And uh, so, so can you can you say maybe a, just a bit about your research and, and finding in in this book? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if, if you'll permit me, maybe maybe kind of entrance story, which actually I, I think Absolutely. is really helpful for making sense. Okay, cool. So um, I, had, I had gotten my PhD at UCLA and moved to the University of Chicago. It's located on the south side of Chicago. You know, this is a, a, a very violent place, you know, very kind of gang saturated place. Um, it was a very hyper police place. And so I got there, I was thinking about policing. And I sat down with a bunch of teenagers. I was interviewing them. I was showing them maps of the South side and they were showing me the routes they go to school <clears throat> to avoid police. And then they'd be like, okay, cool. We talked about police. Now let's talk about gangs. I was like, okay, I guess, I guess we'll talk about gangs. And what I learned, like we would kind of play this game where I would point on the map. If we were sitting here, I'd point on the map like miles away. And I'd be like, so what gangs here? And these are kids who had never been to that neighborhood, but they could rattle off every single piece of information about that gang. Like, this is the sh these are the three shooters, right? These are the, like the three trigger men. But that guy's in prison. That guy was killed wow. last year, and and this guy's got this. They've got you know they've got a Glock, they've got an AK forty seven, they've got this gun. Like they knew what guns they had. They like knew what cars they drove. They knew like who they were dating. And I was like. At first, my mind was blown. And, I, and, you know, every time I'd ask, like, how do you know this? And they would look at me like I was an idiot, like, come on, old man. 
And it was essentially like, they're like, you, you can't be on social media. You can't be listening to YouTube, like Chicago rap, drill rap on YouTube without kind of passively kind of getting to know this stuff. And, and what I learned from them is like, this was a strategy through which they were staying safe. Um, what they would do is they would walk down the street and they, they put their headphones in, but they wouldn't turn any music on. And they would listen to hear um, what songs were being played by people sitting on stoops or, or people like walking with their phones. And what they were doing was tapping into this new development where gangs and, and gang affiliated young people on the south side of Chicago and now in pretty much every major city in the, in the world, really, um, had to have, have had to adapt to some changing economic and organizational conditions. So when the crack economy kind of bottomed out, when heroin and opioids come in, um, when, when law enforcement and the FBI tag team to like cut off the head of gangs, when housing projects are pulled down and, and poor folks are dispersed into a bunch of different neighborhoods where there are a bunch of different gangs and they have to form new kinds of alliances. Suddenly, like the old way of, of, of making money as a gang fizzled, right? There's no longer kind of when you're 13, you're given a corner and a sack of drugs and maybe a gun and told to like go work that corner. Those days are over. Like that's, that's the wire. That's the, like, those are the olden days of like the gang and drug economy. And so young people, we're looking around like, what's the new economic opportunity? And it's like, aha, there's money to be made on the internet. There's money to be made in the digital economy. We can monetize YouTube. Um, we can become influencers. We can gain status and notoriety. Um, and maybe I've been a ticket out of poverty, right? By saturating social media profiles and YouTube rap videos with as many guns and as many drugs and as many boasting of crime as we we possibly can. Um, and so I, I, I started to learn this, this new kind of development. I hadn't heard anybody talking about it. And so like a good ethnographer, I decided I've got to go to the gangs. Um, and so through a young man who I was doing a, um, I, I, I had launched an, an after school program uh, with young people. And, and one of the guy's older brothers was one of like the main shooters, the trigger man, and like one of the most popular gangs. And I say popular gangs because the gangs are also rap groups who are making, right, making music online. And he was just kind of tickled, right? That like, here I am, like this professor guy, he like knows a lot about us, he knows our songs, he knows our rivals, he knows our allies. This is this is weird, but like kind of cool. And I like notoriety and he said he's gonna write a book and like, who, know, who knows what's gonna happen? And so he was like, come on in, come on in and invited me into the, into the housing project where these guys are based out of and introduced me to everybody. And I spent, I spent about two solid years every single day, pretty much. Um, I'd leave my apartment in, 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 um, in the South Loop, my, my condo in the South Loop and pick these guys up when they woke up. Uh, we'd drive you know, around in my car, we'd play dice in the, in the back alley of the housing project. We'd you know, go, go, go visit you know, girlfriends. We'd drive all over the country um, and just really trying to understand like why 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 this transition happened and like what motivates young people to portray this kind of super predator kind of stereotype um online and, and just as i was doing this work I'm, I'm really glad that i had begun doing this work because suddenly the media politicians and uh you know police officers district attorneys decided that like this is the kind of new boogeyman Right. And um, I, I think it's a it's a testament to like the power that ethnography can have to kind of myth bust to push back against these narratives, because because I would hear suddenly I started hearing from like district attorneys. I mean, Eric Adams in, in New York recently, you know, made a lot of, of news with this. But I would constantly hear this this the same kind of statement, which is like, well, why would somebody put images of themselves holding a gun online, you know, if they didn't if they weren't really using it or if they weren't like, you know, don't they, they know they're going to get caught. And so it just, it just goes to show just like what kinds of menaces they are. They must like really hate the law or they're super oppositional. 
Um, and I and I think like what my research showed was that you know putting hyper violent content online for these young guys was actually like one of the most powerful ways that they could feel love. Um, and I think that like this is one of the things that I'm trying to show in the book is that when we examine their behavior from like I don't know a middle class or like elite academic institution like that looks irrational like why the hell are you going to put call out a rival and say hey I'm going to shoot you and put a gun and boast about a murder like why would you do that you're either going to get killed or you're going to get attacked or somebody's going to arrest you like the cost benefit analysis on this thing is horrible like why would you do this but when you like give that stuff up and actually go there you're forced to reckon with the fact that like this is a population who gets zero love, like no matter where they go, right? Like their teachers tell them that they're terrible, that they're not going to amount to anything. They're pushed up against the wall by cops on a daily basis who, you know, they're told that they're like menaces to society, you know, even people in the neighborhood, the older people in the neighborhood really dislike them on the, in the media, in the news, the mayor is talking about them. Like we just absolutely denigrate these guys, right? And not just the denigration, but like, there's a kind of fatalism too. I mean, at, at the time I was doing this work, it was something like only 8% of Chicago public school kids would ever go on to get a four-year degree. 8% of, 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 of CPS kids. Like, it, it just blew my mind. that so like, if you know that like that few of the folks going through your same classes are, are, are ever going to get a four-year degree, which we know is super important in this economy, like that, that, that creates a kind of, a, a kind of fatalism as well. And then they discover that like, they can get love off posting sensational stuff. I mean, every single time that little heart pops up on Twitter, right? Or every single time somebody likes you on Facebook and you're getting thousands and these guys have millions of views, like that feels good to all of us. Like I, you know, I'm not on Twitter as much as I used to be, but I go on Twitter all the time. Oh, you know, that was a really smart tweet. Uh, you know, five people liked it, you know, or like, oh, I made a cool Instagram video. Like, I don't know, I'm very unpopular. Like 10 people liked it. But these guys were like getting stopped in the grocery store, right? Um, I, I was, I, there was one young man who, you know, his mom had like kicked him out of his house because he was messing up. And, you know, he's in Walmart one day and this girl runs up to him, this teenage girl runs up to him and she wants to take a selfie and she's posting it on her social media. Um, and like, I remember when he was telling me this story um, and his mom had been watching it, watching this happen, watching this girl run up to him. His mom uh, came to Walmart with him. And he said that like, this was the proudest he had ever seen his mom mm -hmm. was that like seeing someone appreciate his son. He was, he was, a, he was, he was one of these rappers who, who did this hyper violent rap. And, you know, like that matters. Like this is giving young people a vehicle for being seen and heard and recognized as special. Um, it's giving them this kind of historically new vehicle that we, I think, have systematically kind of like stolen from them. Um, you know, some of these guys who are these drill rappers who are really popular, some of the stuff was mind blowing, who are pretty popular. I would travel around the country with them. They would book like shows or, or you know, I remember one time, I forget where we were. Um, we might've been like Savannah, Georgia. Like we drove to Savannah, Georgia. And cause somebody wanted to like record a, a, a song with them to put on their YouTube video. And uh, we're sitting in the, ho in the motel parking lot and this car full of, full of girls, uh, teen teenage girls pulls up and is playing their song, right? And like gets out and recognizes them. We've gone all the way from Chicago to Savannah, Georgia. I don't know about you, but no one has ever recognized me from the author photo of my book. Nobody, nobody's in Walmart like Forrest Stewart. Oh my God, your analysis of policing is so good. Nobody, right? So you can imagine like, what if you lived in a world where suddenly people were doing that? You know, they're like streets of gold. Like this is the most amazing thing I've ever read. Um, like that feels magnificent. Right. So you tell me, right. You, you tell me, Eric Adams, how you're going to fight that. Right. Like these kids are willing to tempt arrest and death to get hits of that stuff. Um, so that's what the book is trying to do is trying to get us to rethink 
what the kids are doing and why they're doing it. Yeah, it's amazing. And, you know, but some of the content is quite amazing, right? I mean, some of them are like incredible musicians and they actually make yeah. a million views because they are just like, uh, uh, you know, by the way, if if people who, do you, have you seen that people who make it in social on social media or have successful career in music and become rich, uh, you know, kind of give back to their communities to help with social mobilities for the others? Is that is that a thing at all? Hmm. You know, I mean, the thing I do see is like taking your homies with you, right? So like, and and this is like how I how I explain how gangs operate nowadays. These kind of digital economy gangs. What I usually see is like, you've got your shooter you've got your main man and you've got like one other person who are like your central people who protect you, who like go to bat for you, people who are willing to defend you physically from the violence that might come. The more popular you are, you yeah. get victimization. I see when, when somebody makes it, I see those guys getting scooped up, but I, I don't see, and there's not a ton of money once people kind of make yeah, it any bigger, I right? See. Like we're talking about like kind of like C level, D level celebrity. Sure. Um, you might, they might make like one album, but it, there, there's not much more, more going on than that. And yeah. so they'll, they'll take the guys with them. They're super loyal guys. And it's really interesting. So what you, what you have now are these gangs where um, there's maybe like a, a, like a foursome, a foursome, a foursome, a foursome, like within, within the gang. And like these guys are just like super close knit and they, they kind of peg themselves, kind of attach themselves to the one who has the kind of most right. social media clout. And like that becomes the new social organization of a gang. It's no longer this kind of like hierarchy. It's like this small closed group because they know if this guy makes it or when this guy gets money, it, it, it's coming back to them. Yeah. So Forrest, at the risk of making myself sound like the narrow-minded economist that you portrayed a few <laughs> minutes ago, you know, like, oh, no. how, how important do you think is it is to create like meaningful economic opportunities to these folks so that uh, you know there is something to look forward to and, and if if there is anything like that you know is there any policy recommendations that you think might be useful here yeah oh man you know i i end i end like any good sociologist i feel like i end both of the both of those books with the same what I am now dissatisfied with call for structural change, right? So, which I think is, is still very accurate and which I think is still very important. And at the end of the day is the answer, right? That like the problems that I described going on in Skid Row, the problems that I described going on with these young men on the South side of Chicago, the behaviors that they're engaged in or the conditions that they're in at the end of the day, right? Are about not having meaningful economic opportunity, educational opportunity, not having affordable housing, not having health care, and living in hyper-violent neighborhoods, right? I think that's also something that we don't often think about because, and want to mention, because if we talk about people need to be protected from violence, we're often then equated with like, oh, well, then we should throw the police in the neighborhood. Well, clearly, I don't think that. So we also have to like solve that violence. And, and I think, I honestly, I, I think that like, we have had some policies um, in American history that have done a lot to lift folks up. I mean, we, we just saw recently, right? Like the, the, the child tax credit, like brings a lot of, a lot of children out of poverty. I mean, I, I don't actually think it's that much um, or like that crazy of ideas um, that we would need to implement to do this. But I do think that we need to shoot for those kind of big prongs. Um, kind of, you know, the sociologists are gonna gonna say like, go restructure society. That said, I've actually become dissatisfied with kind of ending our diagnoses, ending our analyses with that. Like, yeah, I, I, I have given enough lectures and I see people kind of roll their eyes like, oh wow, we just, you know, sat through an hour of you describing misery on the streets of urban America. And now you're gonna tell us like redistribute wealth, <laughs> you know? Um, and so I've, I've been looking around for um, interventions that I think uh, are highly effective, um, highly scalable um, and are immediate. And um, one of the ones that I'm kind of falling in love with that I think is really good that I'm, I'm doing this, I'm working on a next book about is a program up in San Francisco that I think is for me, um, one of the kind of best things to come out of 
the kind of summer of 2020, the George Floyd protests, uh, the, the movement for Black Lives, the kind of defund the police movement. Um, there's this organization in San Francisco in the Tenderloin, which is, you know, as many people know, one of the you know most difficult, most violent, um, most impoverished neighborhoods that we have, certainly on the peninsula, definitely in San Francisco. Um, and what Urban Alchemy does is they employ uh, formerly incarcerated people. And these are often people, they, they kind of privilege folks who have spent, you know, they, they call them long-term offense LTOs. These are people who have spent like between like 10 and 40 years behind bars. If you think of what that population is, that's the population that was first kind of getting hit by like, like three strikes laws, zero tolerance policies, all the kinds of war on drugs, war on crime kind of stuff that like ballooned, um, ballooned the prison population. So these guys are getting out. Returning citizens, like this is a difficult population. They're, they're likely gonna cycle back through the system. We know these are folks who are gonna be homeless. We know these are folks who are gonna have a hard time getting jobs. So they really kind of like cross out so many of the issues that returning prisoners have and they give them meaningful, good paying job um, with benefits. And what they do is, so it's like, I think that's like check one, right? Like we have, we have done something meaningful there, but then the thing they do next, I think is even more important, which is they put them out on the streets as community-based public safety practitioners. And they've got them positioned where they're covering on every corner of the tenderloin and then folks walking back and forth. <clears throat> and what these guys do is they use their kind of lived experience, their street smarts, and their familiarity with the community. They're out there from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. So they know every single person on that block. Um, so they know this guy who's um, got mental health issues or this person who's got substance use issues, you know, they might be unstable on Tuesdays and Wednesdays when their social worker isn't around or like this person was just evicted. So now they're on the streets and they can kind of manage the block to make sure that no issues like hit the level or no fights kind of hit the level or no disturbances hit the level where someone calls the police or the police stop, or we have these issues, um, right? They know who's armed, they know who the drug dealers are. They're kind of managing the streets. Jane Jacobs, this kind of like uh, patron saint of urban studies talks about eyes on the street and like kind of sidewalk ballet and how we informally control uh, neighborhood kind of like disruptions and disorder. These guys are doing it. Um, we actually just, I, I, my small research team has just completed um, an analysis that shows since 2020, these guys had significantly reduced crime. Um, and so I think like where the rubber meets the road of like creating meaningful jobs, creating meaningful, you know, these guys get housing, creating meaningful housing while also reducing violence and also reducing the kinds of sidewalk conditions that make poor neighborhoods hell sometimes to live in. Um, they're doing a both, right? So, so, so many of those kind of like high end structural issues, I feel like this is one of the best kind of ground level instantiations that I've seen. I mean, these guys are reducing, are, are reversing, you know, hundreds of, of ODs, right? They're walking around with Narcan, hundreds of ODs, you know, per month. I, I was, you know, I, as an ethnographer, I was out, you know, morning, noon, and night with these guys. Uh, and I remember there was like a 12-hour period where I and this practitioner I was shattering reversed five overdoses, right? Like these were people, thanks to fentanyl coming into the drug supply, these were people who like were dead on the sidewalk. These were people who, you know, we had lost their pulse. Um, that these, and the ambulance wasn't there, the police weren't there. If it weren't for these guys, I think that these five people may not be alive today. So like they're quite literally saving lives and they're managing the kind of disorder in the, in, in, in the community. Um, yeah, in, 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 in ways that we just need. And so I'm, I'm currently working with this organization to see if this is something that, that, that we can scale. It, it seems to be, you know, really hitting on, on a lot of those issues that I, that I talked about. This is fascinating, uh, Forrest, you know, like uh, shifting gears a little bit. Uh, so, you know, can you, like, what led you to do this kind of work to begin with? <laughs> oh, gosh, what led me to do this kind of work? Um, you know, I think there was a, there was maybe a combination. So, so I think some of it is, is kind of personal experience where I grew up. I am, I am originally from San Bernardino, California. Uh, it's about 60 miles outside of, outside of Los Angeles. Um, it's a, it's a city that, you know, when I was growing up in the eighties and nineties, 
was having a rough time. I think we, you know, for a few years were, you know, I think it was like outside of Detroit, we were like the poorest county or poorest city in the United States. Um, we were the homicide capital per capita of the United States for quite a few of those years. Um, you know, I, I experienced, you know, friends of mine's fathers being kind of gunned down in, in gang violence. Um, you know, my own family has, has my grandfather and my father have spent time incarcerated. You know, I, 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 I saw the way that like gang violence can get in the way of, of learning, of, you know, shootings at schools. Uh, like I, I, I experienced some of that firsthand. Um, you know, I wasn't like directly involved in any of that stuff. I would never, never claim that. Um, but you know, I, I, I went off to college. I went off to UC Santa Cruz. Um, and, and I had this bug of like, how do we, how do we explain and how do we improve what's going on in cities like mine? I always kind of envision of like, I want to do the kind of work that might help, you know, my city. And, uh, yeah, I, I I think I got kind of whipped up into a frenzy by by Angela Davis, who was in uh, UC, at UC Santa Cruz, still is at UC Santa Cruz, and got thinking about you know the prison industrial complex and how poverty and how incarceration actually makes some folks money, um, and this really pissed me off, and I I decided that um, we need some more kind of up close accounts to really figure out what's going on, and then once we figure out what's going on, to be able to to be able to push those levers. So it's it's San Bernardino. That's that's why I'm doing the work that I'm doing. <laughs> Can you recall a moment, like one particular moment, when you knew that your ideas were having an impact? Mm. This is this is a good question. Um, so so a lot of my work, I, I feel like as as we've just discovered, a lot of my work isn't the most easily transferable. I think into policy and policy discussions. Um, I think there's there's a lot of other work that uses different methods that like can very easily be like, look, if you, you know, I don't know, if you if you give people $700 a month, like X will happen. And it's like, okay, a politician, it's very easy for them to them to do that. I think transferring ethnographic findings into say like policy is a little more difficult. But but where where I think ethnographers, field workers can really make an impact is actually on the ground with the communities and the groups and activists who are doing their stuff or fighting their fight. You know, what, one example that, that kind of jumps out in my head, I was in Skid Row um, and, and one of the places where I was collecting data kind of observing was this activist organization, the civil rights organization in Skid Row. They're called Los Angeles Community Action Network. They're really fantastic. And one of the things they were doing at the time was going out into the streets at the time, it was camcorders. Um, they were using camcorders to videotape police interactions. And what they were doing with these police interactions is they were giving them to lawyers at the ACLU and they were giving them to public defenders to try to show that, um, you know, these were unwarranted stops or that police were violating people's constitutional rights. And I was interested in how they were doing the work that they were doing. And I was also interested in like what the police were doing. So I was going out with them running around the streets. And um, I remember there was this moment where it was, we all kind of had this realization. I'm sitting in the room while they're thinking out loud of like, we don't know which videos are good videos for evidence, right? Like we've collected thousands and thousands of hours but like, we don't know which ones we should hand over. Like we're not, we can't seem to make sense of like which ones helped exonerate someone or which one helped like an ACLU class action lawsuit. Um, and at the time I was like, well, hey, guess what? Like I'm actually thinking about this stuff and I, I'm, I'm writing field notes. And like, what if after every time we went out, like we came and sat down and we talked about like what worked and what didn't work and what elicited what kind of behavior out of cops. And through this kind of really cool iterative process where I engaged them as kind of like researchers with me, we started narrowing down like what made for a good video, like what made a video fail, what made for a good video. Just for example, like one of the things that popped out was that like they, they hadn't been as quick to realize, I, they would have realized this if I weren't there, but maybe not, maybe not as quickly, is that if they arrived on the scene once the officer had already initiated the stop, it was really hard to make the claim that this was an unwarranted stop, 
right? Like they, the officer would immediately come up with some kind of narrative. And when this, when this video went to court, the officer could, could clearly take the stand and say, look, like, no, like I saw him, he's making furtive movements or he's doing X, Y, and Z. And so one of the things that we, we one of the, the techniques that kind of came out of these thinking sessions that we had was like, what if we, not we, what if they, they would say, what if we like kind of post it up on the block where we think that the police are gonna come and so we kind of like hide a little bit. And then once the police come down the street, then we come out and we start the recording way before. We kind of like capture the street scene before the police ever show up. Um, and they started doing this and it immediately started to create some successes. Um, and they actually um, were able to win with some of the video that came directly out of, out of those sessions. They were able to get all these class action lawsuits through and some injunctions that prohibited the police from doing this practice they were doing, which was uh, the police in the city of Los Angeles, is they would, um, the city workers would like take a rake and walk, they'd walk down the curb and they'd take a rake and they'd snatch homeless people's belongings like out of their hands, like suitcases or clothes or backpacks and they'd rake them into the street. And then police officers would stand behind them and threaten to arrest people who tried to go get their property and they would arrest them. And so now the organization's filming them doing this. And so then the city would take these um, skip loaders, you know, the, the kind of tractor with like the big bucket on the front and just wheel it down the sidewalk and just pick up all the stuff all, all along the entire street and then like dump it into a, into a kind of a dump truck. And then they'd hit the next block and do the exact thing. I mean, this is, this is against the law. <laughs> this yeah. is violating quite a few constitutional rights. Um, but, they, but, they, but they were having some difficulty showing this given the kind of video techniques that they had previously. Um, but yeah, but after, after kind of doing this work with them together, you know, this is one of the things they were able to turn up. Um, so, you know, this, this certainly sticks out in my head. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and the... Uh... The other side of it is, can you can you tell me about uh, maybe a research project of yours that failed? You know, you've been so successful, uh, or or about like a, a moment of of particular frustration that you had, and like what what did you learn from from this kind of more negative experience? Oh, I, I feel like moments of frustration are like daily in my, in my research. <laughs> oh, I mean, I you know, like with this with this guy, I I do have some like bigger moments, but I will say that um, you know. Ethnographers who, who kind of like do research and like my style, we've kind of like made a, a virtue out of being wrong. Um, you know, there's there's this thing that we do. There's this method that I teach. It's called abductive analysis. And there's this this process that we call theoretical sampling, where it's like you go into the field, you take your observations, then you come up with a hypothesis. And then your job the next time you go back into the field is test that hypothesis. And you are always wrong, <laughs> but it's great to be wrong. It's great. And you're like, you're, you're like, gosh, you know, I didn't get it right. But what's beautiful is that you say, ah, I didn't get all of it wrong. I got a little bit right. Now I've got to explain, try to 98%. Let me come up with a hypothesis that's better. And then you go back and you're like, most of it was wrong again, but I got a little bit more right. And that's, you just keep going back and forth, back and forth. Eventually you hit the point where like you're, you're 99.9% .9 right. Um, <laughs> and that wrongness isn't there, but no, I mean, I am, I am wrong all the time and projects are, are failing until they're not failing all the time. But um, I can recall, you know, the, one of, one of the, one of the ones that sticks out in my head about being a, about a failed project happened in Skid Row. Um, I've tried to find a way to write about this, but, but, but I can't seem to, can't seem to find the form or the menu. So maybe this is the one, finally, I get to talk about this failure. Um, so I had realized while, you know, a few years into researching the kind of immense impact that policing has on people, on their minds, on their livelihoods, I was like, wow, like we don't actually, and certainly in the United States, have any kind of like good statistical data, survey data about like how many times one people are encountering the police, like having an interaction, how many times they're seeing the police. And then what I thought would be really cool is how often they're talking about the police, which I thought if we could collect numbers on this, just kind of raw numbers of like people in Skid Row have conversations about policing, I don't know, 15 times a day. Like this is the kind of stuff I was seeing on the streets, but like I wanted to quantify it because we got to put some numbers on it so people will believe us. Um, and I was like, I need these numbers because then we can compare, we could imagine comparing that to like doing a, a survey in other countries, in more advantaged neighborhoods, like suddenly we have like a measure 
of, 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 of the rate by which policing saturates the minds of people. And if, and if my ethnographic findings are correct and saturating the minds of people, if this does such damage, then we have a new form of inequality that we can quantify. And so I was like, yes, this is gonna be the project. I love it. And so I, I got funding and I put together a team of, oh gosh, I, I remember I flew out some graduate students from University of Chicago to Los Angeles. There were like three or four of them. And what we did is we created a diary study. And these di diary studies are really great. They, they use them in all kinds of different stuff. They use them in like public health around like, um, you know, do a diary about like condom use and like how you're talking about sex or, you know, you can do food diaries with people in public health. This is going to be a police diary project. And I was like, this is going to be super innovative. What we did is we bought hundreds of these little USB sticks that had microphones on them. And we recruited hundreds of um, residents in Skin Row. And their instructions were, every time you see a cop, every time you interact with a cop, or every time you were talking with your friends about cops, I want you to just like click the button, just record a little something, you know, just like tell us what it is. Um, and so, uh, you know, I hired a research assistant on the ground and once a week, Folks were supposed to come into this designated office, plug their USB stick in, and we would download everything, right, for each individual, and then we could aggregate it. I thought it was brilliant and, and just like foolproof. So a few weeks go by, and people are coming in with their USB sticks, and there's nothing on them. Like, there's <laughs> nothing on them whatsoever. And I'm like, wait a second. I know this can't be right, because I'm, I'm like... I stood with you on the street yesterday, you know, and we were talking about policing and like, you never recorded this. Um, and I don't know, I, and, and you know, I, was, I was back in Chicago. I had been flying back and forth to do this project. And I remember, I, you know, after like three weeks, I, I had come back into LA and I sat down with my research assistant who was the one every week who was putting in the USB sticks to record stuff. And I was like, what the heck is going on? And she was like, policing is too ubiquitous for this project. And I was like, you know, like, what do you mean? She, she was like, she said, people have become so kind of like, police have become so normalized that it doesn't even like trigger them to have like an extra thought to be like, oh, this is a special occasion and a special occasion deserves me talking into my microphone. And I was like, tell me more. How do you know this? She was like, let me give you an example of like the last guy that came in here, a, a guy that I had known. She, she, he came in and it was empty and, 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 and she was like, you know, like, you know, you're supposed to record like when you interact with cops. And he was like, oh yeah, I haven't had any significant interaction. And she said, when was the last time that you interacted with a cop? And he goes, oh, uh, five minutes ago. And she was like, wait, no, t t tell me what, what else? What was going on? He was like, well, I was walking across the street and I saw a cop on the other side. And he was like, I know what they always do. They're gonna, they're, as soon as that red light starts flashing, they're gonna, they're gonna put me up against the wall for jaywalking. So before I even got to the other side of the street, I pulled out my identification to get ready for the stop and frisk. And so I walked over and I showed it to him before he even said, get up against the wall. He took, the, he took it and like kind of looked at it, kind of looked at me, gave it back to me. And then I walked into the office and gave you my USB stick. And she was like, that's exactly what we're trying <laughs> to get at like that's what we're trying to capture is that people are so used to being policed and stopped and frisked that you just like make it part of you like you are already have your id ready because you know what this guy's gonna do so it was a massive failure it was a total <laughs> failure but it but interestingly it was a failure precisely because my hypothesis was so right that policing had become something we couldn't even measure in a kind of quantitative way in this way, at least, because like people were inured to to the presence of police. You, you discovered Einstein's not everything that counts can be counted, and not everything that can <laughs> yes. be counted counts. <laughs> that is so beautiful. Oh, yeah. I love that. Yes, yes, I am living proof of that. <laughs> so, so finally, Forrest, uh, what advice would you give to to like young students? There are many of them here. Uh, in a, you know that, that are interested in a career in sociology or ethnographical research. Um, come study with me. Uh, is the is yeah. the is the first Absolutely. one? Absolutely. Like, let's <laughs> let's make Stanford. And I I, I stand behind that too. <laughs> okay, good, good. Um, you know, I mean, I, I, I if, if you'll permit me, I think like this is advice that I would like to give to folks interested in sociology and ethnography, but. I don't know, maybe also advice to give to folks Absolutely. who want to be like citizens. Um, I don't know, I think like 
getting into this stuff, I often recommend for kind of my, my starting kind of ethnography sociologist is to just be rabidly curious, um, to ask people tons of questions, right? Whether you're talking to your roommate, whether you're talking to your parents, and especially when you're talking with someone who you disagree with ideologically. We've got election season coming up, and I think this is a beautiful opportunity um, that, like, to flex your ethnographic sensibility, to sit for a moment and, you know, um, consider the notion that you might not actually understand why this person feels and thinks and acts the way that they do. And the only way to get that information is to like shut yourself up, <laughs> close your mouth and ask another question and another question and another question and, and consider fathom for just a moment that this person is not crazy. This person is not dumb. Um, that This person might be, you know, just as rational and just as passionate and just as, um, have just as much care about people in the world as you do. Because I think that like, that's what drives really great social science. That's what drives really great ethnography. And, and I think that's what drives great citizenship. I, I would love to live in a world where more of us, especially as 2024 comes up, where more of us would flex this. Because I think, I mean, not, I'm, I'm gonna get on my soapbox now, but I, I, I just think that like, I would, I would like to think that the kinds of political projects we could engage in you know, in Washington, they call it talking across the aisle or working across the aisle. If we if we just, you know, kind of consider that maybe people have the same values that we do, but like they're manifesting in a different way because of the conditions that that person is living in. If we could like cut through that and kind of understand that it's our conditions that are leading us to disagree and not like our fundamental essences that are leading us to disagree, um, that's ethnography. And I think like, that's good citizenship. Forrest, this has been such a huge pleasure as always. Uh, thank you very much for, for doing this. Oh, this is amazing. This is so cool. And I'm, I'm, I'm so glad you're doing this. I'm looking forward to, to hearing what other folks say that you're going to be meeting with. All right. All right. Thank you.